script. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Pi Day. Thanks so much for joining us today for our webinar on the Quantile Framework for Mathematics. Um, I must warn you that in honor of the day, the Metametrics team has been eating pie since 8 a.m. this morning, and we're a bit feisty. So we hope you're going to be patient with us over the next hour, and I'm hoping many of you have been celebrating the day as well. But we're so excited to have so many of you online with us this afternoon to learn more about the Quantile Framework and the tools that we at Metametrics make available to support math instruction. My name is Ann Chiano. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President for Government Relations at Metametrics. And today I'm joining you from our office in upstate New York. My work at Metametrics is primarily with uh, state leaders throughout the country, education chiefs, governors, first ladies, legislators, who are interested in assuring that the results from high stakes assessments are meaningful and most importantly, actionable on the part of teachers, parents, administrators, and students. Currently, we have close to two dozen states that report quantile and lexile measures from their state assessments. During this webinar, you're going to hear more about how, the, how these states and their districts use the quantile framework to support students' achievement in math toward measures of college and career readiness. But today, my role is to facilitate our, our webinar. When I received a list of registrants, it once again validated the commitment we have to mathematics in this country. The fact that so many of you are logged on at this hour on a Friday afternoon, the Friday before St. Patty's Day, is truly remarkable. Online with us are state leaders, district level administrators, teachers representing K-12 as well as higher ed, individuals representing national and state professional organizations, as well as individuals from educational publishing companies. So we have a wide array of folks joining us. Some of you are new to the Quantile Framework and are going to be hearing about it for the first time, while others, I know, have been using this tool at the state district classroom level for years. Unlike the Metametrics Lexile Framework for Reading, which has been around for close to three decades and is becoming more and more popular, especially now as folks are questioning the value of standardized testing, the Quantile Framework is relatively new and has only been available to states, districts, classrooms for around eight to 10 years, the past eight to 10 years. So we're excited to share it with you today. Joining me from our North Carolina office are two colleagues whose work centers on the Quantile Framework. Lisa Bickle is the Director of C&D Quantile Services. She leads Metametrics work with assessment development and heads up our Quantile team. Her background in product development includes work on technology, and PRIP programs for prepaying right to college. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Dan. Happy to be here. Happy Pi Day, everyone. And David Lyons is our Director of Product <coughs> Development, Product Management, excuse me. Dave oversees development for several Metametrics websites, including Quantiles.com. Dave has been designing and producing educational software since 1996 and has a young daughter and twin sons who he affectionately refers to as his quote unquote QA team in training. I'll be surprised if we don't hear a few stories about his little ones later in the day. He's a wonderful dad. Welcome, David. Thank you, Anne. Good to be here. Great. We're also very honored to have with us today our special guest speaker, Dr. David Driscoll. Dr. Driscoll served as the Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts from 1998 to 2007 and is a former secondary school mathematics teacher with a 49-year career in public education and education leadership. He's a former president of the Council of Chief State School Officers and currently serves on a number of boards, including Teach Plus and the U.S. Education Delivery Institute. Dr. Driscoll chairs the Thomas B. Fordham Institute Board, as well as the National Assessment Governing Board, which is responsible for producing our nation's report card, NAEP. We're honored to have you with us today, Dr. Driscoll, and we thank you for the passion you bring to this work. Welcome. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> thank you very much. And let me add my gratitude to the people that are on the line that have taken time on a Friday afternoon, as you say. Uh, to talk about mathematics, that that shows dedication and dedication to Pi Day. Uh, it, it it is interesting that you note that uh, Lexiles 
uh, are so easily accepted uh, across the country. It's a wonderful thing and, and a great tribute to Metametrics to have developed it and, and, and it's been very effective in, in a whole lot of ways with schools and districts and kids across the country. Uh, and people just accept it as a scale they, they understand. And, it, and it's curious to me because uh, when you think about mathematics, mathematics skills build, I think, more readily in, in one's mind. If you think about uh, uh, ratio, you need to know uh, multiplication of whole numbers, then fractions, and then ratio builds uh, on sometimes uh, uh, certainly in, in geometry and, and even trigonometry. So lexiles, in, in my mind, are, are harder to get your mind around, and yet people accept the scale, the, you know, the 1240 uh, lexile scale. So we're hoping today to kind of demystify uh, the, the quantile uh, framework and, and the skills and so forth, and uh, so that people better understand the quantile scale as, as they do the lexile scale. You'll also be pleased to know that uh, Ian uh, referred to me as a guest lecturer, guest speaker. Uh, rather than speak today uh, in, in some kind of uh, lecture mode, uh, what I've decided is to, to actually introduce three problems, student problems, uh, as we go along. And I think they'll be uh, illustrative of what, uh, what quantiles are about, what mathematics skills are about, and, and how things build, and how uh, we really are expecting a lot more of kids today, particularly to understand the mathematics, not just be able to compute and those kinds of things, but really uh, a deeper understanding. And I think you'll see that uh, through the problems that we have. So I'm delighted to be here and, and to be part of today's program. And we're thrilled to have you. And it's that passion for mathematics that uh, we love so much in you, David. So thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to those uh, to the problem solving as we go throughout the, uh, this webinar. Chris, why don't we switch to our agenda? So let me, this is um, uh, on the screen here, you see the agenda for today. For those of you who are new to the Quantile Framework, we want to begin with a brief And then we're going to turn to some of the enhancements that our Quantile team has made, not only to the framework, but also to the tools that are available to teachers and others to support this framework. Um, we'll then turn our discussion to focus on math opportunities available through our Summer Math Challenge, which is entering its second year of operation in summer 2014. And by all means, uh, before closing, we will take time for the pie giveaway. So stay tuned. I do believe you must be present to win. Am I right with that, Dave Lyons? Oh, yes, absolutely. If you leave okay, early, so no, no pie. No, okay, no leaving early. All right. So quickly, before turning this over to Lisa Bickle, let's quickly um, review some of the logistics. Up on the screen is a phone number. In the event that you get disconnected or you're experiencing any kind of technical difficulties, please just use that number to call us and we'll get you right back up online. Now throughout this webinar, we invite you to submit questions to the Q&A moder moderator from the uh, drop-down menu um, in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. As you do, please include your full name and um, organization. Uh, Lisa, I think that's it for the do's and don'ts, introductions. I'm going to turn this over to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Anne. Okay, so some of you have heard of the Quantile Framework. Some may be totally new to Quantiles. What I'm going to do is just give you a very brief overview. The Quantile Framework really describes the student's mathematical achievement and the difficulty of specific math skills and concepts. So even if you are new to the quantile framework, you may know what lexiles are. These are this is the parallel framework on the reading side. And it turns out that both of these frameworks have some things in common. Both, of course, are developed by Metametrics. They're both developmental scales. They both use this scale to measure two important aspects of learning, the learner and the lesson. Students can have a lexile measure of reading ability, and students can have a quantile measure of math readiness to learn. Books and reading materials can have a lexile measure. Similarly, math lessons, software activities, and so forth can have a quantile measure of difficulty. And finally, both can be used to help teachers teach more effectively. Now, the quantile framework really works a lot like a ruler or maybe a thermometer, except that instead of measuring length or temperature, the quantile framework measures readiness in math learning, and it also measures difficulty of math tasks. So we're going to take a look at such a task in our first problem of the day. 
Now, I wanted to mention that all the problems we're highlighting today, these were adapted from illustrative mathematics. Uh, and thank you for allowing us to demonstrate using these really wonderful problems. These are all available as free resources on our website, quantile.com, as well. And so right now I'd like to invite Dr. Driscoll to talk us through our very first problem of Pi Day. Dr. Driscoll. Well, thank you, Lisa, and uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, first problem. And um, you'll see uh, right away there's a, uh, at the top, uh, it, it talks about uh, what the goal is and also the quantile measure. And uh, uh, as you'll see, it, 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 it provides three problems below and asks the student to figure out which one of the problems can be represented by or solved by finding three divided by a half. Uh, and, and so it's an interesting question. It's not only about uh, uh, dividing by a fraction and using whole numbers and fractions, but it's also about groupings. Uh, and, and this is a, and this will be a part of the other two questions as well. Uh, we, we urge teachers to, to engage kids in a discussion about this because there's different ways to go about it. Ironically, as you look at, at the three um, uh, possibilities, uh, two of them are right. The first one uh, and the second one both uh, uh, can be represented by three divided by one half. And uh, when you look at uh, uh, the first one, uh, you're, you're, you're asked to realize that uh, uh, there's a large bag of flour, and, and Leo used half of that, which is three. The hope would be that um, they would then realize that uh, double that to get six, which is represented by three divided by by half. In in B, uh, perhaps the students might even want to draw. Uh, some students may want to draw this. They would actually draw a, uh, a long sandwich uh, represented by three feet and then break it into pieces of of uh, uh, a half a foot, which again. Uh, will be six, which is represented by three divided by a half. Uh, the, the third one just doesn't work. It, uh, it's, it's not a representation. And again, might uh, be that a student draws this out, that uh, there's three um, uh, quarts of soup and the family eats half of that, and of course that would only be a quart and a half. So this is a very good uh, uh, problem to have kids to start thinking about uh, fractions and and grouping, and uh, as we say, it's a. And by the way, it's about a. It's a. It's recommended to be a fifth grade problem. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Driscoll. Now, um, some of you, if you're like me, you might be thinking, "Well, I know some fifth graders who might find that problem a bit tricky." And that's really one of the benefits of the quantile framework, because for any particular fifth grader. If I know his or her quantile measure, and I know the quantile measure of the materials, in this case the problem, uh, and it's an 870 Q, I can see if these match. And if they don't, I can change the instruction for that particular student. That's one of the benefits. Some other benefits are listed here. Um, because the quantile framework is really a scale, it's helpful in several ways. Um, as I mentioned, mentioned, teachers can really match student readiness with task difficulty. They can forecast whether a student is going to be successful on a particular material, how ready is that student for that lesson. Teachers can more easily uh, differentiate math instruction for either struggling students, giving them some free teaching or some background knowledge, or they could provide enrichment opportunities for students who are actually getting the material at hand, giving more advanced students um, material at their level. Maybe the most important benefit of all is that teachers can actually use quantile measures to track growth over time. Let's dig a little deeper here. Um, as I mentioned, that the skill associated with our first problem had a quantile measure of 870 Q. So remember, the quantile framework is a scale, like a thermometer. So just like degrees on the thermometer, the units on the scale are quantile measures, and these are represented by a letter Q. So 780 Q, it's 870 Q is 870 quantiles. Students receive the quantile measures, and their, their measure, a student's quantile measure, really indicates his or her readiness 
level of readiness to learn mathematics. Now, in the same way, lessons and other math tasks, we calibrate these here at Metametrics to the quantile framework, and they also have a quantile measure, such as our problem we looked at today. So, how does this all work? Well, quite simply, when the student measure matches the measure for the math task, that student is likely to be ready for instruction on that task or lesson. So, students receive a quantile measure in just one way, by taking an assessment that's been linked to the quantile framework. Now, this assessment may be their state's assessment. Our state partners provide quantile measures because their state tests have been linked to the quantile framework. A student may also receive a quantile measure from a math program that has quantile assessments built in, such as our partner Voyager Sopris Learning. The quantile framework has been linked to several norm reference assessments too, such as College Board's Ready Step, and you can see several examples there. Another important way a student can receive a quantile measure is through a formative assessment that's linked to the framework, such as the Scholastic Math Inventory, and most recently we've added Curriculum Associates iReady assessment that's been linked to the quantile framework. Now remember, we have two sides to the coin here, the student measure and the measure for math tasks, which are calibrated by Metametrics, and lessons in textbooks are one such task. Now, we've calibrated actually hundreds of textbooks, and these are located on our website, quantiles.com. I'm showing you an example here. This is a screenshot of the website, and it's Big Ideas Learning, the Grade 6 Green Book. This is a Common Core curriculum. This has been calibrated, and you can see the quantile measures lesson by lesson and chapter by chapter, as well as resources that are available for those. Now, before we go to another problem with Dr. Driscoll, I want to tell you one more thing that's new to the Quantile Framework this year. It's really based on our original research of that framework, but we kind of kept this idea behind the scenes until right now. Metametrics will now be reporting specific measures for very basic math tasks. Prior to this, these measures were reported as simply the letters EM, which stands for Emerging Mathematician. And some of you might know that. And what emerging mathematician measures represent are measures that are below zero. So for the, all the math folks, EM is really replacing the negative sign in the measure, right? So um, see the thermometer there, just as we have degrees below zero, we have measures below zero on the quantile framework. For instance, if you were to look at the skill that involves modeling uh, addition for sums to 10, this has a quantile measure of EM260Q, which really means 260Q below zero on the scale. So the quantile framework really spans the development and continuum from kindergarten um, concepts through math, uh, the math that's typically taught in Algebra 2 and Geometry and Trig and Precalc. So the ranges of the measures go from EM400Q, 400Q below zero, to above 1600Q. So the next problem that Dr. Driscoll is going to present is associated with a skill that has a measure of 800Q. Dr. Driscoll, here's our next problem. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Lisa, and, and I hope you enjoy this one. And uh, we, we actually uh, provided a little... Uh, a diagram on the right to start uh, thinking about how this might uh, evolve. But students are asked to look at uh, a, uh, a series of triangular tables put together to see how many kids could actually sit uh, if you had a series of these tables. And in fact, uh, assuming the class had 23 kids in it, uh, you might want to ask how many uh, triangular tables put together would it take to to accommodate all 23 students or 25, whatever is in the classroom. Uh, this, uh, uh, you'll be happy to know, uh, is, is uh, recommended to be a class discussion, teacher-led. Uh, it takes some discussion. This is not, not a simple uh, problem by any means. Because what we're asking is students to really think about what you would do with 125 tables. So obviously, it can't just be calculated. In fact, we really want them to think about what would you do if you had n tables. So it's really 
even though it's a sixth grade question, and again, the quantile measure is 800Q, uh, this really builds to its functions. And, uh, and what students eventually realize is that as you, well, they do it by table. So you can see with one table, you can see three children with two tables, four with three, five, and then you can continue. And eventually, students will see the pattern that develops uh, whereby the number of students is uh, two more than the number of tables. So in, in fact, if there were uh, 26 kids in the class, you would need 24 tables. Uh, and then we hope to have them think about if you had n number of tables, then it would be n plus 2. And uh, all kinds of discussions, uh, if, if you look at the bottom one, you'll see that the the, the outside table on the left and the outside table on the right can accommodate two students. And that's true no matter how many tables you have. Whereas the ones in the middle, you'll see, if you think about the diagram on the left, you'll see you can seat two on the first triangle and you can seat two on the rightmost triangle. But on the other three, you can only sit one. And that's the pattern that follows. So it turns out to be n plus 2. So a great question for kids to think about logic, set up a table, talk it through, uh, and come up with this pattern, which eventually leads to thinking about functions. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Driscoll. I think this is a problem is a great example of tasks that we really will help students become college and career ready. They're doing a lot of hard thinking here. There are some skills that a student would need to know, though, before tackling this problem, such as perhaps understanding what a rate of change was. So this understanding a rate of change would definitely be a skill a struggling student would need to learn before they could actually tackle the problem. And so um, just teachers can use the quantile framework to really match a student with the materials they're ready to learn to help get them college and career ready. So here's how this works, right? We have the quantile framework, that's the scale. The quantile measures are the units on the scale. So imagine the scale is the number line. I kind of gave you an illustration there. The quantile scale has over 500 points, or each point is a math skill or concept. And each one of these has a measure. And each measure shows how difficult one skill is in relation to the other. So these specific points on the number line represented are called quantile skills and concepts. Now, we changed this terminology. They used to be called Q-taxon. Some of you may remember that word, Q-taxon. But we thought this word, we had a couple focus groups and some um, advisory groups, and they said, boy, this word sounds a little bit like crouton or maybe Q-tip. So we actually changed it. So quantile skill and concept, and we abbreviate that as QSC. So each quantile skill and concept has two parts, really. It has a description, and it also has the quantile measure associated with it. So these are associated together in what we call a knowledge cluster. So here's an example of a knowledge cluster. You see in the middle the skill solving one-step linear equations and inequalities. And that is skills that the student <coughs> needs to know, there are skills below it that the student needs to know before learning this, right? So they're called prerequisite skills. And an example would be QSC 97. That one is locate points on the number line. That we would need to know before especially doing inequalities, right? So this concept they must know before in order to progress. Now, the skill that would be above this Solving one-step equations would be solving two-step equations uh, and inequalities. And that skill is in the group that's above the, the arrow pointing upward. And that's called an impending skill, or QSC. And that has a higher quantile measure. And it's something that students would advance onto. So prerequisite QSCs and impending QSCs are associated. So a knowledge cluster really has four parts. The focus skill we're talking about, prerequisite skills, impending skills, okay, and then supplemental skills. Now these are skills that are related, but they might be in another strand, such as if you are learning to multiply two digit numbers, you might be able to learn you may be able to learn how to find the area of a rectangle. That's a skill associated, so it's supplemental. 
Now, I wanted you to understand the knowledge cluster so you could really understand the changes that were made to enhance the framework and make it more effective for getting students ready to be college, ready for colleges and careers. Now, if you're a common core state, you know there are changes in your curriculum, right? So we made some changes as well to the framework. First, we made changes to the text only, and these really didn't change the measure at all of the skill, but made it more aligned to the language used in the Common Core. So here's a few examples. The first one there, we added the words in number and word problems. Now I might point out that's an EM210Q, meaning that's below zero, EM210. So we had this as part of the items that we tested and part of what made up the measure, but it wasn't spelled out. So we just added the words there. And the second one, again, we added some specific terminology, including representing whole numbers as fractions. This is spelled out in the Common Core, and it's actually something we already did, but we didn't have it included in the description, so we added that. And in some cases, we actually, in the last example, really did change the language that was used, um, compare and order fractions using common numerators or denominators, and um, that just really makes this more specific to what, what we were testing and what the Common Core was getting at. Now, the next type of change we made, and by far the more important change, was to, to make a more effective framework was we added 81 new skills and concepts to the framework. A lot of these were added on the upper end, such as more statistics that was included in high school, um, but they're also scattered throughout the grade levels to reflect any new types of skills or concepts introduced. And here are just a couple examples for you. And that first example that says write addition and subtraction sentences that represent a two-step word problem. We um, really never had anything that specifically represented using two steps in a problem, so we added that one. Now the next example is grade four idea about finding unknown measures of angles using addition and subtraction. Um, again, we didn't have that represented in the framework. And our last example there, find the coordinates of a point on a segment between given endpoints that partition the segment by a given ratio. That is the uh, cousin to the midpoint formula, which we did have in the framework. We had the midpoint formula, but this is by far a skill that's um, much dif more difficult and uses proportional reasoning to determine how segments divided. So we didn't have that represented, so we really added it. So when we add a new quantile skill and concept, we, th this has to have a description, but it also has to have a measure, right? that ties it in with the existing framework. And I thought it might be interesting for you to learn kind of how this is done. So I'd like to specifically look at a skill, write addition and subtraction sentences that represent a two-step word problem and solve. Our first thing we do, our first step is really, we build a knowledge cluster for this new skill and concept. And we build that by saying what prerequisite skills and what impending skills and concepts do we need in our knowledge cluster? So this is the spreadsheet version right here, and you'll see also that that has the quantile measure for everything that we do know, right? We're building the knowledge cluster around that new one. And here it is kind of prettied up. We can get a relatively good estimate of that measure just from looking at the knowledge cluster, but that isn't really good enough. Our final step is we actually test the estimate by using items associated with the skill and concepts in our research in field tests. Now, the field test results really statistically confirm the estimated measure or else send us back to repeat the process. And so this process of um, going out and having this field tested to get the measure that's actually the same process that was used when the original framework was developed in which our research was with tens of thousands of students who are part of field studies. The results of these field studies were then used to create the framework. So this idea that the quantile framework is empirically derived should instill confidence in you that the scale is far more replicable than what could be done with expert judgment alone. If you ask two mathematicians what is relatively more difficult than another, you may get two different answers. And so just having expert judgment 
without having that tested isn't as reliable as going out and doing the field test and getting the statistics and building the framework from the statistics. So before we turn it over to Dave Lines, he's going to give us um, a sneak peek at a new visual representation of our more effective quantile framework. I'd like to just sum everything up for you by saying that the quantile framework really places the materials and the student on the same scale with the goal of improving math instruction. Okay, so we're going to next hear from Dave Lines, our Director of Product Management at Metametrics. Dave. Thank you, Lisa, and thanks again to all of you for joining us on a Friday afternoon before a long weekend to celebrate Pi Day with us. I'm going to talk a little bit about the new quantile map, and then I'm also going to talk about the 2014 Summer Math Challenge. So this is our current quantile map, which I'm sure at least some of you have already seen. We've used this map over the years to help illustrate the quantile framework, and we've found that a visual representation of the framework is a really good way to help parents and educators understand the framework. But we felt that the map could use an update, so we got together with our design team and came up with the new quantile maps. That's right, not one, but two new quantile maps. The map on the left is the same size as the current map, which is 11 by 17. This map provides a high-level overview of the quantile framework and is designed primarily for use by teachers and other educators and as well for professional development. The map on the right is smaller at 8.5 by 11 inches and highlights some of the details of the framework that we don't really have room to show on the big map. This map is designed for use by teachers and parents and especially to help teachers help parents understand the quantile framework, for example, in a parent-teacher conference. Uh, these maps are not yet available on our website, but we wanted to give you guys a special Pi Day sneak peek. So let's take a closer look. So here we've zoomed in on a cross-section of the new 11 by 17 map. As you can see, we've added a vertical quantile scale at the far left. One of the things we really wanted to achieve with the new map was to reinforce the idea that the quantile framework can be used to measure growth. And we thought this would be more apparent if the quantile measures on the map increased in a vertical direction. You might also have noticed that the new map is vertically oriented, whereas the old map was laid out horizontally. In the background of the image, you can see a web, or like a constellation, that we're using to convey the idea that the quantile framework is really an interconnected web of skills and concepts of varying degrees of difficulty. In the foreground, we've highlighted a few example quantile skills and concepts, also known as QSCs, as Lisa mentioned, to provide some detail of the points on the map. Down the right-hand side, we've added a longer list of QSCs to show how extensive the quantile framework really is. Okay, now for a closer look at the new 8.5 by 11 version of the quantile map. The new 8.5 by 11 version is based on the 8.5 by 11 version of the Lexile map, which was created last year. The idea with these smaller maps is to provide some great specific detail that, as I said, we don't really have space to show on the larger maps. The 8.5 by 11 version of the quantile map is actually five pages long and includes an overview page and one page each to focus on grades K through 2, 3 through 5, 6 through 8, and 9 through 12. So the page we're looking at here focuses on a fictional high school student named James Henry. And at the center of the page, you can see that we've highlighted a focus skill that has a quantile measure that matches up really well with James Henry's quantile measure of 1000Q. And we're also showing a couple of prerequisite skills that are at a slightly lower level and an impending skill at a slightly higher level. Again, we're conveying the idea that the quantile framework is an interconnected web of skills and concepts of varying degrees of difficulty. Almost all of the quantile skills and concepts in the framework have prerequisite skills that you need to know first and impending skills that come after. Okay, let's take a quick break and look at another math problem. Dr. Driscoll, do you have a problem for us that our friend James Henry might enjoy? Well, interestingly enough, uh, David, as you see, it's a quantile measure of uh, 1040Q. 
uh, and this is actually a seventh grade problem. And in honor of Pi Day, we've we've talked about these circles as as uh, pies, uh, one large pie and and uh, seven smaller pies within that uh, larger pie. Uh, essentially, this r really is a is a question of knowing area, but it also requires some logic. And again, I think we've picked. Uh, problems here to show uh, not only the mathematics but the thinking uh, that that that's involved. And in this particular case, it's recommended that the teacher assign it, perhaps uh, to, to to all of the students uh, for a short period of time, and then talk about it or small groups, or even as a homework assignment. But that that everybody come back and and talk about. It. Uh, we made it a little bit easier than. Uh, uh, it is for seventh graders because Lisa and I actually drew that radius. Uh, the problem does not have that radius. The problem has the large circle with the smaller seven circles and then the shaded area. And the question is, uh, what is the uh, area of the shaded area? Uh, what we like to call is, uh, if you thought of the large pie and then you took the small uh, seven pies out of it, You'd have the you'd have this pie dough left over, and and what would represent this shaded area? So um, essentially, what we would hope is that students the uh, radius of the small circle is five uh, uh, centimeters, and so uh, what eventually we hope would come out of the discussion and the, and and the way in which students would go about this is they'd realize that the large circle had a radius of 15 centimeters and therefore had an area of pi r squared or 225 uh, centimeters squared pi. Uh, each individual pi would have an area of 25 pi, 5 uh, centimeter radius. And so uh, it would be 225 pi minus uh, the uh, 175 pi for the seven circles, leaving uh, 50 pi. So 50 pi would be the dough left over, if you will, from taking the seven smaller pies uh, from the larger uh, piece of dough. Um, and then this shaded area represents one-sixth of that. So we would hope students would... Uh, Take 50 pi, divide it by 6, which would get and then reduce, and it would be 25 pi over 3 uh, centimeters squared. So that would be the answer. The logic would be to take the area of the large circles, subtract out the 7, and then divide what's uh, left by uh, 1 sixth. So uh, an interesting question, and and a, and it uh, recommended as a seventh grade problem. But again, with the discussion, and I think you've seen in all three problems that these require uh, students to think it out, talk it out, and those are the kinds of skills we want kids to develop. So back to you, David. Okay, thank you, Dr. Driscoll. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the summer math challenge. Last summer, we introduced the summer math challenge as a math-focused counterpart to our extremely popular Chief Summer Reading Challenge. And I'm happy to report that our first summer was very successful, and so we will be offering the Summer Math Challenge again this summer. And by the way, what you're looking at right now is our brand new Summer Math Challenge logo, which we are very proud of, and which you will soon be seeing on all of our Summer Math Challenge posters and on our website. So, but you might be wondering, why do we need a Summer Math Challenge? Well, the research on summer math loss is actually pretty sobering. Summer math loss is more pronounced than summer reading loss. Students lose math ability regardless of household income level. Parents are more likely to read with their children than practice math skills. As Ann mentioned, I have three little ones of my own, and I, I read to them every night before bed, but we don't always do math problems. Also, math practice is less intuitive and more technical than reading practice, which could lead to fewer parents working on it with their kids. And on average, all students, regardless of socioeconomic status, 
lose approximately 2.6 months of grade level equivalency in mathematical computation over the summer months each year. So that's why we need a summer math challenge. The good news is that Metametrics has created the summer math challenge to help address some of these problems. Now, the Summer Math Challenge is a six-week-long email-based math skills maintenance program. Parents go to the Summer Math Challenge website and enroll their children. And uh, starting on Monday, June 23rd, they will begin receiving daily emails that focused on one math concept per week and include links to activities and resources related to that weekly concept. The idea is that the parents will do the activities with their children and the focus of the whole program really is on reinforcing skills acquired during the previous school year. Um, we're specifically not trying to teach the kids anything new. Uh, we just want to help make sure they don't forget everything they learned last year. So the same as with 2013, we will be targeting students who are entering grades three through six in the fall. And the uh, entry level will be based on the student's quantile measure. And because not every student has a quantile measure, um, if, if they don't have one for their children, the parent can just enter the child's grade, and then there's a menu where they can select whether the child finds math easy, if they do math pretty much at grade level, or if they're struggling with math at grade level. So here's an example of a daily email, an actual email from last year's Summer Math Challenge. Uh, this particular email is from week four and is for a fourth grade student. As you can see, the weekly concept is equivalent fractions. And as I mentioned, there are a couple of paragraphs to explain the concept. And this is for the benefit both for, for the parent and the child because the, the parents probably don't remember some of this stuff. And then there are links to an activity and a video, both of which obviously are related to the weekly concept. The daily practice is meant to be pretty quick, not more than say 20, 30 minutes, and something that the parents and children can do together. Okay, this is a screenshot of the Summer Math Challenge dashboard. The dashboard lists all of the children that the parent has enrolled in the Summer Math Challenge, and you can see here that we have Josie and Ollie, which are not fictional children. Um, and then as you can see, there is a large square displayed for each week of the program. So you can see we have weeks one through four, and if you click on the arrows at either end, you can scroll to the other weeks. And clicking on any of these big squares takes you to a weekly summary page which lists each of the daily emails from that particular week, including all of the activity links. And this is helpful in case you're on vacation or for some other reason you missed some of the daily emails and want to get caught up on the daily activities. If you like, you can even like the daily emails and share them on your Facebook page uh, if you want to share those activities with your Facebook friends. You also notice there's a big orange download certificate button. And if you click on that button, you get a customized Summer Math Challenge Award Certificate. It was really important to us last summer that we make sure that there was a way for kids who participated in the Summer Math Challenge to let their teachers in the fall know what they had worked on over the summer. And we also found as the uh, Summer Math Challenge was going on last summer that many teachers were asking parents to print the award certificates as a way to verify that the students had participated. And as you see, the certificate has a square for each week of the Summer Math Challenge, and that square identifies the concept that the student worked on that week. And we also put in little concept IDs at the bottom right of each of those squares that actually correspond to quantile skills and concepts, or QSCs, that you can find in the Math Skills database. So if a teacher wanted to get more information about any of those concepts, they can just go to the Math Skills database keyword search and find in information related to that particular quantile skill and concept. We thought this would also be a good way to introduce teachers to the quantile framework. Okay, this is our Summer Math Challenge poster. Um, you can da download these absolutely free from quantiles.com slash summer hyphen math, um, which is also where you would go to get more information about the Summer Math Challenge or to uh, register for the Summer Math Challenge. Okay, so here's a map showing participation by state for the 2013 Summer Math Challenge. The different shades of blue that you see indicate varying levels of participation from state to state. So the darker the blue color, the more participants we had from that state. 
And I'm very happy to say that we had participation from parents and students in all 50 states in our, in our very first year, so we're really happy about that. We we're also very happy uh, to be able to form partnerships with state education agencies in 14 different states, and we're looking forward to partnering with even more states for the 2014 Summer Math Challenge. So for 2014, we've added some new features to the Summer Math Challenge, which we're really excited about. Our Wednesday emails will be called Real Life Wednesdays, and we'll focus on activities related to day-to-day -day life to help make the math concepts seem a little less abstract. And on Fluency Fridays, we're developing a simple math game that will provide students with math problems related to the math concept for that week and give the students a chance to practice what they've learned. Uh, the Fluency Friday tool will also be uh, a give us a good way to track whether students have completed the activities for that week. So the timeline, um, parents can start registering now, uh, again, at quantiles.com slash summer hyphen math. And then on Monday, June 23rd, parents will begin receiving daily summer math challenge emails. And Friday, August 1st, will be the last day of the 2014 summer math challenge. Okay, so now we're going to take some questions. Um, Chris, have we got any questions from our group today? Okay, this looks like an excellent question. Can more than one skill have the same quantile score, or is there a one-to-one -one correspondence between skills and quantile numbers? I'm going to let my colleague Lisa handle this one. Actually, uh, thanks, Dave. Sure. Actually, uh, if you... The idea is that the, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the measure and the skill, except you may also have a skill in a different strand that has the same quantile measure. So if, say, you had um, something in measurement and you had something in numbers and operations, they could come in at around the same quantile measure but be a totally different skill. So it's, it's actually um, not a function, but it's more of a one-to-one uh, -one correspondence within a strand. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Let's see, uh, do we get any more questions, Chris? No, that's all the questions. So apparently uh, Lisa and Dr. Driscoll and I did an excellent job <laughs> of explaining the quantile framework, and you'll all understand it perfectly now. And while we select our lucky free pie on pie day winner, oh wait, did we, I think we had one more question there. I think we did. Oh, the question was, will the slides be available? And, and we will make them available uh, when we send our follow-up email after the webinar. So we have a, a delightful uh, pie day comic for you here. I'm sure you've never seen this one before. but. It never gets old for us. Um, and while you uh, take a moment to enjoy that, probably won't take you a full moment, um, we're, we're going to pick our lucky Pi Day winner. And I might add that we are not just using a regular put all the names in a hat idea. We have a random number generator we're using. <laughs> There's an app for that. <laughs> That's right. Okay, we we have a winner. And the winner is, this is very exciting, the winner is Mr. Harold Frederick. So congratulations, Harold. Oh, no. Harold is not on. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Harold, see, that's what happens. Harold left before the webinar was over, so Harold actually did not win. So let's see. Okay, we have Ben Zahn, uh, who is the winner. Congratulations, Ben. You'll, we will be sending you a um, gift certificate from our good friends at Porch Pies in Los Angeles, California. And um, I know the folks that got pies last year wrote me back, and they all said they were wonderful. So you have something to look forward to there. Um, I think Dr. Driscoll is going to uh, give us a few closing comments before we leave. I'd be glad to. <clears throat> On my screen came a question about uh, the uh, data. Is there data to support the fact that the summer 
math programs have actually reduced summer loss. So the question would be, do we have any data to that effect? Uh, no, as, as I mentioned, we are um, only getting ready to start the second year. The first year of the summer math challenge, we weren't specifically collecting data um, from, from the students. So, you know, at this point, no. Um, we, I, I will say that we have a lot of anecdotal evidence from users of the Summer Math Challenge who, who were really pleased with it and felt like their, their kids enjoyed it and, you know, it helped them remember some of the stuff that they learned from the previous year. Great. Thank you, David. Very quickly, uh, I'd just like to add uh, one uh, major theme here, and that is that, you know, if you think about a young child and, and you hand them these days any kind of technology, you really don't have to give them instructions, right? They just take it and bash around on it and figure it out. And, and that's because they don't have any fear. Uh, they're excited about it. They're not bored. And, and I think about that uh, in the way in which I think uh, demystifying mathematics and uh, developing the skills in a logical way so the kids have the prerequisites to handle problems, making the problems more real, uh, and, and, and fun in, in a sense. And, and, uh, and I think that's hopefully what, what you heard today. And so uh, just as kids get excited about technology and, and want to use it, our hope is that in mathematics, rather than look at it as boring old word problems and the kinds of things we used to do, uh, they, they're, they're everyday problems that they can talk out, they can reason out, particularly if they have the skills. And you can see it in the three questions uh, that we use today and in, in some of the other examples and if you look at the skills. So I'm hoping we helped demystify quantiles. Uh, my hope someday is that quantiles will be every much as understood as and accepted as lexiles because uh, I think it would go a long way towards helping our kids in uh, mathematics achievement. So thanks, everybody. I, I, I enjoyed it, and, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, a participant, so it was great. Thank you. So uh, this is Ann Chiano. I'm hoping that uh, we've piqued your interest to get on quantiles.com. And for those of you who are hearing about it for the first time today, you become acquainted with the tools that are on there. David points out the uh, importance of um, these math problems in relation to students. Um, I spent many years with the New York State Education Department um, as director of curriculum and instruction, and I know how important tools are to classroom teachers who are not certified in mathematics but are required to teach mathematics. So when you look at the tools on Quantiles.com, I'd ask you to think of it through that lens. How, how would the Quantile framework support elementary classroom teachers as they prepare lessons and need to match up and differentiate instruction for a classroom of 20, 24 children, all at different varying levels of mathematics? So. Let me just uh, echo what uh, Dr. Driscoll has said and others. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. Um, as with all of Mathematics webinars, we're going to archive this one. Next week, you'll be getting an email um, from quantiles.com, which provides links to the recording, um, resources that we discussed today, as well as links to contact information for members of our Quantile team. Um, again, special thanks to you, Dr. Driscoll, Lisa Bickle, and David Lyons. Um, Hey, everybody, have a great weekend. Thanks. Bye now.